We are Troy and Penny Maxwell, the senior pastors of Freedom House Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we want to welcome you to our YouTube channel. That's right. You can catch all of our messages, all of our services. There's incredible worship, and I know God's going to touch it in a powerful way. Absolutely. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube right. channel. Freedom House, what's going on out there? Everybody good? Come on. Well, we are Aaron and Stephanie Blanton. We are the campus pastors here at Central Campus, and we're glad to be with you guys today. If you did not know it already, Freedom House has three campuses, and basically we're a part of the teaching team. It's a privilege and an honor to be a part of the teaching team. And what we do is no matter which campus you go to, you have a live communicator bringing you the Word of God every single week. That is the vision of our senior pastors, Troy and Penny Maxwell. I love their leadership. They're on the forefront, standing up for freedom, standing up for God. Can we give it up for them? Come on. We love our senior pastors. We love their vision. And I'm so thankful that we get to be here with you today, Central Campus. Come on, give it up for yourselves. We were at South End last weekend, and we're going to Lake Norman in a couple weeks. But we're excited to be continuing our series called love, sex, and dating. Guess who was sex. <laughs> I think he's a little bit excited about that middle <laughs> one today. So anyway, um, we are kicking off this series, and we are so excited. We're going to take you on a little trip today, if you can't already tell. We have brought our baggage with us, and we're going to head out. And we are taking a trip today down memory lane. Back to the day it all began, right? The day she laid eyes on me. The day he laid eyes on me, <laughs> right? So this is going to be a fun little trip that we're taking. We're going to take you with us and um, just talk about our journey a little bit. There so, might be some people on a trip right now. Yeah. Hello, online people. We love you. Thanks love for joining you. in today. Yes, and so uh, we, it all started the day that I was sitting outside of a single Sunday school class at my previous church. There were seven of them, and I was at the one that Tall, Dark, and Handsome walked up to. And so he came up to the table. I slid a visitor card across the table to him. And on the card was two boxes. It said, visitor or member. And when I slid it across, I said, just check visitor right now. If you ever want to join the class in the future, you can just fill another one out. And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, I'll join right now. <laughs> Listen, my dad always told me, if you see something you want, you go after it. Oh All right, so I'll, there I was. And he went after it. But let me tell you what I did. I went and made copies of all the cards for the care coordinators so they could, cop or they could call the first-time guests that week. And I made a copy of his and put it in my purse just in case mm -hmm. I needed it. That's right. But I didn't need it. <laughs> I did not need it. And let me tell you why I didn't need it. So I left the Sunday school class. We were headed down to service. And uh, in the hallway is Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Following me like a puppy dog. So she says. She invited me to come and sit with her. I'm just I saying. I did. I was just being friendly, trying to introduce him to all the singles. Uh, so we get down in service. We're sitting beside one another. And the pastor said something that I could not believe. I'm like, awkward moment. He said, I want you to look at the person beside you and tell them you love them. I was like, holy moly. So we looked at each other and said, I, I love, love you. you. <laughs> It was totally a setup. So we go to lunch that day. Bunch of people going out. Um, he came with us. We ended up sitting across the table from another couple. And her and I were talking about going dress shopping for our upcoming Christmas party. And Aaron looks at me in that moment again and says, I want to go. I was like, 
you want to go dress shopping with us. Absolutely. And so we did. And he ended up picking out a dress for me that day. It was wild. I won't even tell you. That's another story for another day. But the point is, we spent 12 hours that day together. He asked me to dinner. And then he dropped me off that evening. And within eight months, we were engaged. And in 13 months, we were packing our bags, headed for the destination wedding in Jamaica to say, say I, I do. do. That's right. So it was like a little fairy tale. It was so great. It was a great fairy tale until <laughs> we got home. <laughs> and here's what we quickly figured out. Our fairy tale became a drama. Right. And uh, But what, it's Part of it was because he had to become instant dad. Oh, yeah, so I had a nine-year-old daughter when we got married, and he had to figure that out. So now we're this blended family, and it's kind of crazy. And we're fighting a lot, and, you know, we, I, got, I brought all this baggage into the relationship, and he brought some too, which we'll talk about his later. <laughs> right. But we had all this baggage. But let's talk, before we jump into our baggage, let's talk about the difference between luggage and baggage, because there's a difference. Absolutely. Whenever you go on a trip, you take your luggage with you, correct? And in that luggage, you put the essentials, the things that you have to have, right? So I'm sure every single one of us have went on a trip, and we forgot the essentials. We forgot the toothbrush. We forgot the toothpaste. We forgot the deodorant. And what happens? Panic ensues. Where's the CVS? Where's the Walgreens? How do I get my stuff? Yeah, and you have to go get it, because if you don't, things are going to begin to stink. You need the essentials. Sometimes literally, yes. Yes, literally. We won't talk about that. All right, so let's talk about baggage. So baggage is the container or containers that you've been lugging around with you your entire life with all the contents that you've collected from your past that you have not yet disposed of. Mm -hmm. Crazy, huh? And Well, we went on a little trip where we had some baggage. We're going to talk about that, but what we need to understand is that baggage includes, like, hurts. It includes unforgiveness, all those things that maybe, you know what, you want to stand up for your rights. It's like pride and arrogance and um, traumatic experiences, things that have happened in your life that have just hurt you, and you're carrying that around. It's like a 1,000-pound weight on your shoulders. And the thing of it is, is you can't hide it. Like, literally, you can dress it up in a Louis, and it's still in there. It still stinks. Like, everybody can see it. You might be thinking, oh, I'm just going to mask this. I'm just going to, you know, put on this front. Well, guess what? Everybody can see it anyway. They know it's in there. So So let's jump in. Basically, these things weigh you down, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you guys have been to an airport before, and they check your bag weight. And if you're overweight, what do you do with that stuff? Well, that happened to us. We were in London trying to come home. Absolutely. And Stephanie's bag was way overweight. So instead of getting rid of all the excess stuff that we didn't need, we opened four bags and started dispersing it, redistributing it, trying to figure out how to make all the bags work. And don't we do the exact same thing in our relationships? We come into the relationship, we're carrying baggage, and what we do is we try to push that over on somebody else and expect them to carry that. And, and that's exactly what I did. I had so much baggage, baggage that you better believe I expected Aaron to be my bag boy. I mean, he was going to carry it. Yeah, but let me make it clear, though. She was not the only one carrying baggage. I had my own baggage also, Mm -hmm. for sure. So let's talk about that. So what was in your little carry-on? Well, I had a carry-on. I mean, luggage comes, baggage comes in all different sizes, right? Um, But in my carry-on, I had pride. You know, I didn't want her correction. I didn't need to be told what to do. I didn't need her input in a lot of stuff. Um, There's actually several times this happened. Um, she told me how she was feeling, and I said, you don't feel that way. I'm like, yeah, I do. You can't tell me how I'm like, I no, feel. you don't. You don't feel that way. Yes, I do. So I was trying to portray <laughs> under her what I, my opinion was, right? But that was my pride coming through, and I was also harsh. Um, I came across harsh in my body language, in my tone, um, you know, several different things in that nature. But, you know, here's the thing. It may have been a carry-on, but even today, I have the option of taking that with me mm-hmm. and bringing that along for the ride, or checking it. Every carry-on has that option. You can check it or bring it with you. Right. And so today, I still have to check myself and make sure that stuff stays on the side. Yeah, and the reason Aaron brought a carry-on is because he was raised in a Christian home. Yeah. Um, he had a good background. You know, I, I don't know if you want to talk about, you know. Well, before we do that, I but, mean, since we came from opposite sides of the tracks, uh, what was in your suitcase that you brought? Hold bring? on, hold on. No, I want to talk about something else, okay? <laughs> so what I want to talk about is the fact that before marriage, you had no sex, you had no alcohol. No drugs. 
But I did have plenty of rock and roll. You did have plenty of rock and roll. That's right. And so on that night that, you know, we, he was dropping me off for the date, I was flipping through his CD collection, and I was like, oh, this boy is a heathen. He is a heathen. Well, that leads us right into the other side of the tracks, does it not? Let's talk about your background. Okay. So, <laughs> obviously, mine's a little bit heavier, and it's because of my background. So I was not raised in a Christian home. Um, I was raised in a single mom home. Um, she was a single mom, three kids, working a couple jobs just to make ends meet, um, no father in the picture, never called, never anything. We never heard from him, um, just an absent T father. And um, that left me kind of wounded. And that left me wondering why I wasn't wanted. Um, and I started searching. And I left home. And when I left home, I just decided, you know what, I'm going to go find a better life. I am going to go find the life that I want because I'm not living this way anymore. Well, if you don't have the essentials when you go to do that, you have no idea how to get that life, right? And so I left home thinking I'm running from all my problems, and I ran right smack into them. And what I did was I ended up within two months of moving to Charlotte. I got pregnant. I then got married to try to fix that. Then I got divorced, and I ended up being a single mom. And I finally, at the age of 23, stumbled in a church, stumbled on my relationship with God, accepted him as my Lord and Savior, started taking my daughter to church, and then that's when Tall, Dark, and Handsome showed up. But I had plenty in my baggage, and obviously, we don't have time to unpack all of it, um, but Let's I will tell a you... a few things, at least. Yeah, please. I'll tell you a couple yes. things <laughs> <laughs> that was in it. So, first of all... I was independent. I did not need his help. I was a single mom. I made plenty of money. I did not need a man. And I told God that two weeks before he brought him, and he brought him anyway. I don't get it. but He knew what was best. I'm just saying. Okay. So um, a bigger one that I had that was really, really heavy was this fear of abandonment. Um, I was afraid that, you know, because other people had left, because my dad had left, that he would walk out the door too. And so what I did was I projected everything that other people had done to me onto him. And I didn't want to give him any freedom. And at the same time, I wanted to keep him at arm's length because if he got too close, then I'd get too hurt. And so for five years, I battled back and forth with not letting him get too close, but not wanting him to leave either. And um, it, was, it was not good. And I'm going to tell you about something that happened when my baggage started spilling over, y'all. It was like a volcano of baggage that well, came out. We, we don't need to go there just yet. Just hang on. We'll get well, there. Well, hold on. Let, let's just make it clear that it came out because of his mistake. <laughs> we'll get there. All right? Not yet. Not yet. That's on <laughs> another page. Um, here's what we figured out. We had stuff to unpack. Yep. All right? We had excess stuff that we did not need anymore, and we needed to figure out what the essentials were to move forward. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take 23 years of experience Break it down to 23 minutes for you guys, all right? <laughs> and here's what we find out. There's five essential commitments that everybody needs in relationships, okay? So go ahead and pull out your phones. Get ready to take notes. Um, this is the part that you want to do that in. Okay, so hold on. This is for everyone in the room. So singles, mm -hmm. dating, marrieds, want to be married. It's for every single person, even divorced, in the room. Yep. This first commitment I'm going to talk about, it's the key. That's the one that you want to nail down first and foremost before we get to the other four, okay? And that first commitment is commit to Christ. Um, Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. See, we hear this, we say this, but are we living it out? Mm -hmm. Are our actions proving that he is first? I think sometimes we get into this mode of cliche Christianity, where we know all the right things to say. We know the, all, all the right things to do, but we just don't follow through with them. Right. You know, and that, that becomes a turnoff to somebody else. And I think that we should start this point by hitting on the singles. You guys ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Woo, we got somebody in the back ready. All right, so ladies, are you first seeking God or are you seeking a guy? Yeah, are you and seeking men, God? same thing. Are you seeking God or a girl? Right. See, we've seen too many people... Seek relationships above what God wants for them. And what happens is they chase that relationship right out the door of the church. Right. They get unplugged. They don't stay gone. planted. They're gone. They're out in the world. Uh, and culture gets a hold of them. Yep. So are you seeking God 
or a guy, God or a girl. Um, if you're seeking God, that means when a guy or girl comes along, guess what? They're with you. They're beside you. Um, and the best way, honestly, to seek a spouse is to just run your race toward God. I heard this many years ago. Run your race toward God and then look beside you. Look to your left. Look to your right. See who's running alongside you. You don't want to have to, like, turn around and try to pull them along. You want to date the person running their race toward Jesus right That's beside what Pastor you. Penny and Pastor Troy did, right? So Pastor Penny was already a Christian. Pastor Troy was not. They met each other, and Pastor Penny's like, uh, no, um, I want somebody that's on fire for God. <laughs> Pastor Troy's like, I don't even know what that means, but, you know, if you give me a shot, maybe I can do that. And sure enough, he came along. She didn't lower her standards. Right. She raised him that's up so good. before so they good. ever got married. All right, so, yep, good. You can clap for that. That's good. So I want to talk to the married people in the room as well. You see, the foundation of any godly marriage between two people begins with an individual commitment to Christ. Okay, and we have a graphic that we're going to pull up right now on the screens, and it's going to explain this. I saw this many years ago, and it just stuck with me, and I know it's going to stick with you too. Um, so as you'll see, you'll see God at the top of the graphic, um, and then on the left you see the husband, and on the right you see the wife. And what happens is when both the husband and the wife pursue their vertical relationship with God, the gap between them closes. They become closer to one another. And see, if you ever get that off kilter, and start putting all your emphasis on your spouse, there's always going to be a gap. Right, because they're never going to be able to meet they're any not, of your needs. They're not meant to fulfill every need. God right. is meant to fulfill that, right? And so when two people come together, though, you know what the word says? One can put 1,000 to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight, and you become stronger in your pursuit of God, and you are so much stronger in every commitment you make. Exactly. So let's take a look at the biblical model for marriage found in Ephesians 5.25. It says, Husbands. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See, marriage is to be a picture. It's a picture of God's relationship with his bride, the one that he died for. And in the same way, we have to die to ourselves in order to live for Christ and to live for the other person. That means we have to lay down our will, our plans, our desires for the other person, for God, to live for Christ. Yep. So how do we develop our relationship with God? Number one, spend time with him. Now, you hear this every day. Like, you guys hear this formula every single day, I'm sure. Like, somebody's told you over and over again. However, let's take it to heart and let's make the commitment to spend this time. Yeah, spend time in God's word. Listen to what he has to say. See, I can't be doing all the talking and not listening to what she has to say. That's not going to work. No, and I try already telling you, you know, how you felt already, right? That doesn't work. But God's always speaking. All you got to do is open the word to hear what he's saying to you. He's always speaking. So developing that relationship, listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. Right. And prayer is huge. It is. You know, make your request known to God and then listen to what he has to say to you. Right. Okay, the second one is getting around godly people. You want to make sure that you're around couples that you want to emulate. Get around godly people who will challenge you in your walk with God, who will push you forward, who will love shove you into your purpose. Don't be asking the people whose marriages are falling apart, hey, what are you doing about your marriage? No, how about the ones you, you like, oh, 23 years, 33 years. Yeah, I need to listen there, to that. Right, exactly. So the next one is obey God's commands. There are so many commands in the Bible that God expects us to fulfill. And Jesus said, those who love me keep my commands. So it's not about, um, you know, just obeying God. It's not rule-oriented. It's love-oriented. And when we love God, we are willing to keep his commands. So I want to talk to the, everybody in the room a little bit and just give some examples on this. Um, so number one, it's dating God's way. That means no sex before marriage. That's God's command. That's how you live your best life, okay? Um, and have your best relationship is to not have sex before marriage. Also, loving and respecting one another. You know, the guys want respect. The ladies want love. Well, that's difficult to do sometimes. Let's just admit it. Um, none of us are perfect, and we fail. Um, and so, therefore, that brings up another one. Forgiving one another is one of God's commands, he says to forgive each other as I forgave you. And so if he forgives us, we have to forgive one another. One of the ways a daily we, choice. One of the ways we applied that is we um, said never, the Bible says never let the sun go down on your anger. Well, we tried that. We literally tried that. We took it too literal, and we would stay up all night yeah. till we worked everything out. 
and possibly and, get more frustrated while you're getting tired also I'm just saying right yeah it adds like yeah insult to injury right yeah so anyway um what we determined was that we were just going to stop and pause state our commitment to one another state our commitment to Christ and then pick it back up when we were in a better place yeah. um that's how you can stop a a bad fight from going worse yes <laughs> yeah so committing to Christ is the single most important one. Everything else hinges on that, okay? So commitment number two is commit to covenant, all right? Our culture obviously views marriage way different than what God does. Culture says if it's not working out, sign the piece of paper and jump on out of it. It's okay to go find you another one. No big deal. But God says it's a covenant. So what is covenant? So a covenant is defined as a chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises to each other. You'll find examples of covenant all throughout the Bible, but in the context of marriage, the Bible says it this way. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32 says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. You see, when two become one, they are inseparable. They're glued together. They cannot be separated. All right, let's get this visual. All right, have you ever tried pulling tile off a wall before? So that tile is bonded to the wall. Mm -hmm. When you pull that tile off, it not only damages the tile, but it damages the wall too. Same thing. When two people come together and become one, when you rip them back apart, there's probably going to be damage that takes place. Right. So to help us gain a better understanding of the permanent bond that marriage creates, we want to talk about the difference between contracts and covenants. Everybody say contracts. Contracts. Covenants. Covenants. So contracts are mutually beneficial agreements. They say, what am I getting out of this? Where covenants are for better or worse. They say, I'm here for you regardless of what I gain. Right. Contracts assume a breach, have loopholes that we call prenups for non-performance and can be broken with a penalty. Now covenants on the other, side, on the other hand are designed to be fulfilled and if broken, they have repercussions. Contracts call for the signing of names. Where covenants call for a binding of hearts. See, it's not merely just an intellectual decision to get married. It's a heart decision. And that carries so much more weight. A covenant carries so much more weight than a contract ever would. Absolutely. So let's talk about the weight that our marriages do carry. So Pete Scazzaro, in his book, Emotionally Healthy Leader, incredible book. Everyone needs to read it. He said, your marriage is your loudest gospel message. When I read that, that just really hit me. It really stood out to me. And the reason is, is because when we love and sacrifice for our spouse, it points back to the love and sacrifice of God for his church. It's yep. an example. It's a witness of God's love to the world. And this is why it's so important to commit ourselves to covenant. Now, we want to talk a little bit about how we do that. So number one. Die to self. Um, you know, too many times we have pursuits, we have things that we want to accomplish, but it's really not good for the relationship. You know, so many people are giving so much time, 80, 90 plus hours a week to the marketplace and pursuing the title, pursuing the job increase, all those different things, but they forget about the relationship that's supposed to be the last of a lifetime right here. You know, your job could be gone tomorrow, but what about this? You know, 80, 90 hours there, but only 10 here, that's not going to work out too good. You have to be committed and give time to it and die to your own personal pursuits. Right. So how else do we commit to covenant? Well, it's the merging of income and expenses. Mm -hmm. It's the merging of debt. And that's a difficult one for some people. But what that means is we combine our bank accounts. We combine our retirement and stock accounts. We put each other down as beneficiaries on our life insurance policies. And then that way, if you kill them, you'll have benefits beyond death. <laughs> <laughs> We've all thought about it just saying. Anyways. <laughs> it's also assuming debt. So if one person comes into the relationship with debt, it's assumed by both parties. That means we both pick up that weight. We both pick up that debt together, and we're stronger together. That's the thing. How much faster can we pay it off when we both come together to do that? And, you know, that might have you squirming in your seat right now. And don't be elbow bumping people in church. This is point the finger back at you because anytime you're pointing the finger at somebody else, there's three pointing right back at you. Yeah. So make sure you're not elbow bumping right now. But the point is, is that when two become one, debt's assumed by both. And if we have a problem with that, all we have to do is look at what Jesus did for us. He paid all of our debt. 
So why would we have a problem helping our spouse pay off theirs? Yeah, greed and possessiveness will never work in a relationship. It just wants to point fingers is all that does. Right. So I want to jump on this next one. I bet you do. That's right, sex. Let's talk about sex a little bit here. <laughs> so we get all kinds of questions about sex in the church. You know, abstinence, all these different things. What, what's too far? What's all this different stuff, right? The mailbox is too far. If you're going over to their house, just stop at the mailbox. <laughs> yeah. Hey, a guy told me one time, he's like, the best marriage or relationship advice I ever had was never let your feet leave the floor. That's good. That was pretty good. I like good. it. That was good. Right. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. So Pastor Paul in the Word also got these same types of questions. And in the 1 Corinthians 7, in the message translation, it says, is it good to have sexual relations? And he says, certainly. certainly. But <laughs> only within certain contexts. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. I think we see sexual disorder happening all the time, do we not? Yeah. We see it happening physically and virtually. And virtually is sometimes a lot more prevalent than the physical part of it. So anyways, he goes on to say, the marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy the, her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. So what does this mean? It means you got to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Men, if you want to have your needs, needs met. met inside the bedroom, well, then you have to meet her needs outside the bedroom. It's an emotional connection, not just a physical connection. And ladies, if you want his attention outside of the bedroom, that means you have to sacrifice inside of the bedroom. And too many women look at sex as just a physical act for a man, and that is the furthest thing from the truth. They may not want to admit that it's good for their emotional well-being, but it is. It's just as important as their attention is to our emotional well-being is him being desired in the bedroom for their emotional well-being. You see, if, if he feels like he's desired in the bedroom, he can go and conquer the world for you. Amen. Amen. That's right. We'll take care of that later. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Number three, commit to counsel. All right, that is the third one, commit to counsel. Remember the huge mistake? Yeah, you want me to unpack it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. All right, well, let me, before I do that, let me just say committing to covenant is also committing to counsel. See, when you marry that person and you made a promise till death do you part, that means you're going to do whatever it takes to work it out. Now, can it always be worked out? Not always, not necessarily. You know, and God gives us reasons um, to divorce. Um, for instance, abuse or, you know, sexual, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Immorality, yes. Um, and so those are the reasons, but it's still God's desire that we try to work it out. Just because he gives us the reason doesn't mean we do it, doesn't mean we take the out. It just means that we press in harder. We decide that, you know what, we're going to do everything within our power to work this out. And so um, the huge mistake. So I'm on bed rest. I'm eight months pregnant. The doctor says you're five centimeters dilated. We're going to put you on bed rest so that the baby doesn't come for at least another two weeks. She's sitting down here on the front row right now. That's our girl. Um, and so I'm, I'm in bed right I'm on, in the bed. And I look at him and I say, so you're not going to go to that softball tournament this weekend, are you? And I said, I need your help. And he literally looked back at me and said, well, the guys are depending on me. Let me tell you, things started spilling over because I was about to explode. Yeah. And you know what he did? Hold on. Uh, I got to tell it. <laughs> you know what he did? He walked out the door and he played that softball tournament. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. It did not work out exactly the way I thought it was going to, all right? But I will say, we finished second in state that weekend. Come on, somebody. We had a great game. Anyways, um, but no, when I came back, yeah, let's just say it hit the fan, right? It, it, was, it was time to get in some counseling yeah, because, because we, we were not strife. seeing each other eye to eye. You know, we had some strife in our marriage, so we decided to get a Christian counselor and let's work some stuff out. Not just any counselor, a Christian counselor. Right. All right, huge That's difference. for the marriage. Yep. For the marriage. So counseling, here's what it did for us. And by the way, there is no shame in counseling. 
We recommend counseling. I mean, if you need help, get it. God would rather have you get it than just, you know, dissipate the marriage. That's not good. Right. So counseling helped us lay down our pride and see from each other's perspective. Um, it helped us understand what the other person was carrying and how to unpack that. See, we were a team. It wasn't just her problem. It wasn't just my right. problem. It was our problem. And let's figure it out. All right? So it helped us to stop blaming one another and take ownership for our mistakes. Um, it helped her especially address her fears and Pick replace that with courage. Yeah, yeah, I had to find some courage to face my past. It's not something that you just want to face. Nobody wants to dig into their baggage, right? Everybody wants to just sweep it under the rug, pretend like it's not there. Um, but guess what? You're going to have a lump in the rug that you're going to have to step over and that other people are going to trip up on, okay? So we have to dig in. We have to unpack it so that we don't force it on the other person to carry it. Yeah. I mean, it's not fair for me to just dump it on all on him and not um, help unpack it myself. Yeah. So I had to pick up that courage. I didn't want to face those things. I also didn't want him to see some of those things because I was like, he's probably going to reject me if I tell him everything that's going on. So it also helped us learn how the other person receives love. Um, one of the best books, especially if you're new to your relationship, um, Five Love Languages. Because just because I give him a gift, you know, showing my love to him doesn't mean that that's how he receives love. He might need words of affirmation. Well, if I'm tearing him down, he's not feeling very loved right now. Yeah. So we have to do that. And in that moment that we had the big blow up, she needed quality time. She didn't know that she was number one. See, she saw softball as taking her place, that she had to take a back seat to softball. So what I had to do, guys, is I had to lay down the glove for a little while. And I had to work on the thing that was most important. Softball is not the most important. That comes or that goes. But this was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, we became secure in who we were as a couple. And she became secure in a relationship. And so I was able to go. Now she's actually kicking me out the house. But anyways, <laughs> um, now I play golf. I play ball. I do whatever I want. Yeah. But we're secure in our relationship, though. Yeah, so this is something interesting that I want to talk about, um, the word counsel. In the Hebrew, it is the word sod. And that means a confidential discussion or circle of confidence. And that's exactly why we don't want to go to counseling. You see, counseling is an investment. First and foremost, it's an investment of trust. We have to be vulnerable. We have to be willing to extend trust to the other person. Even if they've hurt you, you have to say, you know what? Um, let's do this. I'm going to give you my trust. I'm going to believe that you care about me. I'm going to believe that you only want the best for me, and I'm going to extend that trust to you right now. Yeah, it's also an investment of money. I mean, let's be real. Counseling is going to cost you something. You know, maybe it's redistributing that coffee money or that spending money you were going to do on a trip. Maybe it's to put it towards something that actually matters and it's going to last a lifetime. So cutting off that coffee, cutting off the cable, do whatever you have to do to right. make there, there's a way you can make it happen. Yes. Um, the next one is time. It takes time to heal something that's broken. Um, if you have a broken arm, you go to the doctor. You get it cast to protect it. And it's going to take time to heal. You have to be patient in the healing process. And you don't ignore it because by doing so, it's just going to add injury. And so what I mean by that is I was having a conversation with my daughter last week. And I asked her, I said, hey, is there anything from your past that you're still carrying around, like emotional trauma that you're still carrying around in prepping for this message. And she said, yes. And she, at 19 years old, went all the way back to a story in second grade where she fell on the playground and broke her arm. And she said, when I walked into the classroom and told the teacher, she completely ignored me. All day long, I sat there in pain with nobody to help me. I felt alone. I was hurting. And nobody would do anything. And it left more emotional trauma than the broken arm ever did. And so what we need to understand is when we ignore trauma, when we just sweep it under the rug, we're actually adding to the pain. We're adding to the traumatic experience. Yeah, I would love to tell you that you're going to walk out today and your marriage is going to be miraculously you know, fixed. It's going to all be perfect. You're going to love each other the way God told you to and everything. But it's going to take an investment. Mm -hmm. It's going to take time, mm -hmm. right? Trauma that has been built, building up, it's going to take time to get rid of that trauma. Right. Okay? So that's why we recommend counseling. 
As a matter of fact, you can go to freedomhouse.cc slash counselors and find all the vetted counselors that we have. We've already talked to them. They're not woke counselors. They're good counselors. They're going to point you back towards God and help your marriage come closer together. Another thing you can do we talked about earlier is get around those godly marriages. Um, when we were first together, we got into a group of an, a few other couples, and I started pointing the finger at everything that he did wrong because those couples, every time we got together, it was a complaint fest. Mm -hmm. All they were doing was pointing the finger. He doesn't help me around the house. He doesn't take out the garbage. And so when I get home, I'm like, you don't, why aren't you taking out the garbage? Why aren't you helping around the house? And that, that spirit started getting off on me. And I started pointing out everything he was doing wrong rather than everything he was doing right. Yep. So when you're around good godly couples like life groups, ask those people to pray for you. Mm -hmm. Ask that life group leader to pray for you. I mean, that's what doing life is all about. Right. It's about leaning on each other when you're feeling weak. And when your marriage is struggling a little bit, okay, ask somebody who has a strong marriage to pray for you. Right, and the, the thing is, as you saw forward on the preview, it's coming up on March 8th. It's a great opportunity. Um, you can start there. Just come, and it's an opportunity to unpack all this baggage. It's four classes and a weekend experience to help you experience freedom, to help you walk out the doors freer than you came in. That's right. All right, so number four. Number four is commit to church. Luke 4, 16 says, He, who is Jesus, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. So he did this all the time. Mm -hmm. Also, the importance of godly community is expressed in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus made it a practice to be in church and in community with other believers. And the thing of it is, is you're not just going to get encouraged and get discipled in church. You're going to get to encourage and disciple other peoples in church. You know, maybe your story is one that they need to hear. Maybe you're going to be able to encourage them with something you walk through. There's nothing more incredible than that. So let's get in church and get in godly community. Yep. And if that's not enough, we have some stats for you, okay? So check this out. So Bradford Wilcox, the director of the Marriage Project, he threw this one out there. Nominally attending conservative Protestants are 20% more likely to divorce than wow. secular Americans. So what in the world does that mean? That means people who have one foot in the church and one foot out of the church are more likely to divorce than people who are not even in it at all. Why is that? Well, my thought on this is if you can't commit to the one who is perfect, Jesus Christ, and the one that wants the most for you, the perfect life for you, Jesus, well, then how are you going to commit to the one who's not perfect, not perfect, the one that fails, the one that you have to give forgiveness to? Mm -hmm. That becomes so hard. So if you commit yourself to church, listen to this stat. Go ahead. Okay, so here's another one. Active conservative Protestants who regularly attend church are 35%, everybody say 35%, 35%, less likely to divorce than those who have no affiliation. That's incredible. That's 55% difference between the ones who are in and out of church and the ones who commit. You know, the word says if you plant yourself, if you plant and stay committed, you will flourish. Right. And so let's talk about how you get planted in church. First and foremost, life groups. Um, those are small groups that meet all over the city pretty much every day of the week to do life and community together. That's where you're going to get challenged. That's where you're going to have accountability. Um, and I just love watching, especially I know there's a life group with a ton of young couples in it. And I love watching that because they're always challenging one another to be their best. Um, also serving on our dream team. When you serve, you come alongside someone else. You build relationship. When you are planted and you have relationship, you're less likely to walk out the doors of a church. Yep, exactly. So this last essential that we want to share with you today, it's not just for parents, okay? The last essential commitment is commit to children. See, you're a role model whether you're a parent or not. Michael Ott being on this platform right now, is a, is a role model for all those kids that he's teaching in FH Kids. Right. You know, you are a role model because people are watching you. Whether yeah. you think they are or not, they are every single day. Just by having the name Christian makes you a role model Yep. if you're a Christian. So let's look at what Dr. James Dobson said from Focus on the Family. He said, children are the true wealth of any nation, and in them lies the hope for the future. 
That's pretty profound, and that should compel us to commit to leading children and youth to live God's way. Now, if you're at a loss as to how to lead your kids, all we have to do is look at the father. You know, some of us get into these situations with our kids, and we don't know what to do. We're like at a loss. But all we have to do is look at how God fathers us. Yep, he gives us attention, he gives us affection, and he gives us affirmation. We need to do the same thing to our children. You know, our kids need to see they have our attention. They need to feel our affection, and they need to hear words of affirmation to help them become a whole and healthy individual. Now, will we get this right all the time? No. I've failed, and if you're a parent, you've probably failed also, but that's okay. All you do is reassess and bring it back to what God asks us to do. So how do you give them that attention, that affection, that affirmation? Well, number one, you look them in the eye. You, you put the phones down. You're present with them. Yeah, invite them to sit with you on the couch. Even if they want to watch TV, they don't want to snuggle up. You know how that is. Um, they want to watch TV. Just sit beside them. Be present with them. Watch TV with them. Um, just be there. If you failed, look them in the eye and apologize. Mm -hmm. Say, you know what? When I said that two years ago, three years, I just had to do that a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to apologize for that. I just want to say I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to hurt you. Um, so do that. Um, a father uh, also loves those he corrects, right? He corrects his children. And so if you see him going the wrong way, you have to redirect them and guide them the right way. Um, and maybe godliness wasn't modeled for you. You know, maybe you didn't have that upbringing. But you're, if you're a Christian and you know God, all you have to do is look in his word. And our job as parents and role models for Christ is to be God with skin on. God with skin on. That's what Aaron was for me. You know, I didn't have anybody tangible. You are a tangible representation to your kids. You are like God with skin on to them. So think about this. How your kids see you is exactly how they see God. All right? So here's, here's some misconceptions I want to talk about. If the parent is a workaholic... The misconception is that God's detached. He's uncaring, and it's extremely difficult to get his attention. Hey, God, I'm down here. You know, why are you just leaving me alone? Mm -hmm. If the parent is a perfectionist, the misconception is that God is never satisfied with me. He's always going to be disappointed. He's always going to be upset. That's the misconception of God that we can portray. Yeah, and there's we, a whole list of them, and honestly, we're going to go through all of that and forward. Yep. Um, but here's a sobering question that I want everyone to ask themselves right now. Does the example I'm setting paint an accurate picture of God's character? Whether that's for kids in the kids' ministry, whether that's for your children, whether that's people watching you on the ball field, does the example I'm setting paint an accurate picture of God's character? And that answer to that question should honestly compel us to do whatever we have to do to make the changes we need to make. Yep, Psalm 127, verse 3 and 4 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. It's our job to aim children towards God. You know, we get it wrong sometimes. But what we have to do, step back, refocus, and aim again. And we have to do that in our own lives. So, of course, we're going to have to do it in our children's lives also. But that's what God wants us to do. Absolutely. And even if you failed, we have some encouragements for you today. Because you can pick up and start over right now, today. And the very first one that we want to encourage you with is to keep going. Never give up. Mm -hmm. Never give up. Par parenting is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Right? And the great thing about marathons is even if you get off to a very slow start, you can make it up. You can pick up the pace. You might fall down in the middle of the race. That's okay. You get back up. You keep on going. Mm -hmm. That's where people are encouraging you and getting in God's word is so important. Another one is keep growing. You know, never let your pursuit of God become stagnant Amen. because healthy things grow. So if you're pursuing God, your relationship with him is going to grow. And if you want to flourish, your kids are going to flourish. If you flourish, your kids are going to flourish. Another one is keep showing. Be the role model that your kids deserve. Be the role model they deserve. Your actions will always speak louder than your words. You know, you can say one thing, but if you do something different, they're going to believe what you did, not what you said. So we, we've got to make that commitment. Um, you also have to correct them when needed. But most importantly, be committed enough to change. Be committed enough to change. Um, because if you don't, they're going to get a message that they're unvaluable, that they're not worth changing for. 
And that's what I want to talk about today because that's a message that I grew up with. The message that I believed was that I was not worthy of love. I believe that since my father walked out the door, I was not worthy for him to change. Um, you know, I would ask that question. Was I not worth him facing his fears, facing the baggage, unpacking all the things to love me? Am I just to be discarded like he did? And that really left me wondering why all my life, at the age of 43 years old, back in 2012, I reached out to my father because a counselor said, you need some answers from your past. And so I decided to pick up courage again, write a letter. And two days later, I ended up at the hospital um, talking with him while he was in a coma. And unfortunately, a week later, he passed away. And my, what I thought would be, you know, a fairy tale ending to the drama that I experienced all my life didn't end up that way. He passed away. And in 2012, I sat at his funeral, and I didn't know anybody around. My brother was the only one that went with me, and didn't, none of these people ever reached out to us. None of these people ever cared. And so I'm sitting there, and the pastor gets up, and he gives the eulogy, and he says, John chose to, or John had uh, got married, had three children, and he chose to leave and never return. And it was that word chose that hit me like a ton of bricks because he had a different choice that he could have made. And so I immediately, of course, burst into tears and that was just the beginning of my healing because, you know, what's interesting is the fact that it was the truth that I needed to hear so that I could let it go. That was a hard hard truth. But what I also realized is that there was somebody who did choose me. You see, when I was 23 years old, I sat in a church and I heard about God and I heard about his love for me and I heard that he chose me and that changed everything. It changed everything. And although I was still questioning some of the choices of my father, when I drove home from the funeral from Virginia to North Carolina, and I cried the whole time. I just had to say, thank you, God, for choosing me. Can I have you stand to your feet right now? Just go ahead and close your eyes, because I want to share with you that the God of the universe sent his son he left heaven to come and make his home in your heart. Not only did he do that, but he came to heal you of all the things that you've ever experienced in your past. That baggage that you've been carrying around. The reason he wants you to expose it and not hide it anymore is because when you hide it, he can't put his finger on it. He can't touch it. He can't heal it as long as we have it hidden. But he has redemption and restoration waiting on you, no, no matter what has happened. You know, if somebody's abandoned you like they did me, if somebody's just kind of walked out on the relationship, if somebody has hurt you and said things to you that you're honestly still carrying to this day, you're wondering, am I worth it? Am I valuable? Do I matter? The answer is yes, yes. You matter, and somebody chose you, and his name is Jesus. And so if you want to start that relationship with him today, maybe you don't know him. I want everybody to close their eyes, no one looking around. If that's you, just raise up your hand right now. Just raise up your hand to say, you know what, I want to start. I want to do over. I want a fresh start. I'm going to pray over you. In church, I want everybody to pray with me. Father God, thank you for choosing me. And thank you for choosing me over and over again. Every single day. 
Even when I make a mistake, you choose me again. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for dying on a cross to give me new life. I receive that now in the name of Jesus. I'm deciding today to make whatever commitments I need to make to live the life that you have created me to live. In Jesus' name, amen.